caucus blizzard from Des Moines, Iowa, a race literally frozen, negative 32 wind chill expected. The candidates are dark. Every playbook has been thrown out the window by this storm. The dominant storyline for 2024 will be the weather. Welcome to the Ferris Show on television tonight from inside, thankfully, in Des Moines, Iowa. Our long and arduous journey from Omaha is proof that the weather is going to play a dominant role in every part of this year's caucus. It is the storyline, and it's going to affect who shows up, it's going to affect whether they're able to show up, and it's going to affect the candidates being able to make their closing arguments. And the weather is all the more important because it is a caucus. And caucusing requires something very different than just voting in a primary. you got to drive through the snow on a bitter cold Monday night. Then you got to stand around for a few hours inside the local VFW hall or a local gymnasium. you got to write the name of your candidate on a ballot. you got to turn it in. you got to wait for it to be counted. Several candidates have canceled their final campaign events today. These were their chances to make the final arguments. And those cancellations could very well continue into tomorrow. There's a good chance the weather is going to continue to deteriorate. The Hawkeye State is expected a real feel, otherwise known to us common folk, as the wind chill, of a negative 30 degrees come Monday. Think about the dedication it takes to leave your house when it's negative 30 outside. Yet at least two of these candidates, unsurprisingly, say they expect, dot, 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 they also need their voters to show up. Our voters uh, are people that are, by and large, committed caucus goers. Um, You know, they've signed up with us. You know, they're in it. They're going to turn out. It's going to be negative 15. But I'm going to be out there, and I want you to go out there. So Monday is going to be a test, not only of the candidates' organization, right, their ground game, but not necessarily their breadth of support, the top-line number, but the depth of their support. Bob Vanderplatz, he's the most evangelical, evangelical leader in Iowa, he argues that the challenge of the weather and turnout favors DeSantis specifically. If you believe the ground game, there is a potential he could upend the former president in Iowa. He has by far the best of the ground operation I've seen. Now, Vander Plaats is, of course, biased because he has endorsed DeSantis. If we're to believe the polls, it's a battle for second place. The polling average from our partners at DDHQ show President Trump leading by 37 percentage points. Nikki Haley, second, followed by Ron DeSantis. We've seen a switch between Haley and DeSantis in the past couple of days. History tells us whoever does well in Iowa will likely see a boost heading into New Hampshire, which would prove crucial for Nikki Haley. For someone like Ron DeSantis, a third-place finish could be the end of his campaign. And for the elephant in the room, former President Trump is going to look to avenge his second-place finish in 2016. We start tonight with the state of play on the ground 96 hours from the caucuses. David Drucker, senior writer for The Dispatch, Iowa State Senator Mike Buslow. Gentlemen, good to see both of you. Uh, Mike, start with you. Uh, You've been here for a while. I get the feeling, even in my drive from Omaha to Des Moines, there's something happening just underneath the snow that the polling may not be picking up. Listen, I think what it's not picking up is Iowans are excited. Even on a cold night, people are going to come out. And what the polling might not be picking up, because it can't pick up, is that organization matters. And just like in Iowa, whether it's farming or work in general, hard work pays off. That hard work from DeSantis and Trump is going to pay off on Monday night, I think, is pretty clear. All right. So, David, the, the name I didn't hear is Nikki Haley, who has momentum perhaps coming out of New Hampshire, but not the hard work. She just hasn't been in New Hampshire. As you've traveled around, is there an excitement about her? There's a lot of momentum behind Haley, right? And that's what she has going for her. She doesn't have the organization that Donald Trump has or that Ron DeSantis has. She does have the backing of a super PAC, America, Americans for Prosperity Action, a Coke-affiliated group. They put their grassroots muscle behind Haley. That's why that endorsement mattered. But it's not the same as the Ron DeSantis super PAC never backed down that has been knocking on doors well over a million, I think maybe as many as three million, um, in Iowa for several months, not the same as Donald Trump's organization, which unlike 2015, is a real professional 
well-run and extensive grassroots organization. And so I think the question when we talk about second place, well, there are two things to talk about, Leland. One, does Donald Trump get over 50 percent or not? So that's something to look at. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the battle for second place. Does Nikki Haley's momentum, which seems to be real, do more for her than Ron DeSantis' ground game does for him? And that's just something we can't know. And the weather that you mentioned is a real wild card. Yeah, it, it, Mike, have you you've been lived here all your life, as yes. I understand? Have you ever seen this is what a once in a decade kind of blizzard? You know, this is a big blizzard, but the caucuses aren't tonight. And I've heard a lot of people talking about Monday and the cold. Iowans deal with cold. You know, oh, it's the coldest caucus. Well, we deal with February every year. You know, okay. we get out, we work in this weather, we go out and about. There's going to be plenty take of time. Care of the animals in this weather. Yeah, you got to go out and take care of the animals. You got to go out and go to work. And you, we have time to clear the roads. And frankly, we had a warm December. There's plenty of salt to keep these roads, uh, you know, safe. Iowa has been known to surprise, right? I'm thinking that uh, Obama won in 2008. Yeah. It totally, totally changed things. Mike Huckabee won here. It doesn't necessarily mean, right, that you're going to win the nomination, but it does sort of change the dynamic of the race. What is it, you think, if anything, that has contributed to this sort of change in the race of Ron DeSantis being seen as the alternative to Trump Maybe nationwide he no longer is. Is he seen as the alternative in Iowa? I think that's the question. You know, Trump is the brand. He's, he's Trump. You have the DeSantis organization, which has been here forever, all 99 counties. Gov, you know, Governor Haley, Ambassador Haley, she's been putting the work in as well. But that, that organization, as David said, it's a little late to the game. And so how, can it be made up for with the momentum in the debates and everything else we've seen? And, and don't forget about the base. Um, you know, Vivek Ramaswamy... Expectations are low, but there's a group of the base, including uh, former Congressman Steve King, who've sort of thrown their weight behind him here late in the game. Wow. Uh, David, I'm going to read something to you real quickly. This is from Politico. I know, I know a, a rival organization, but I thought it was an interesting piece. Uh, if we've learned anything, it is the laws of political gravity or axioms about elected politics don't always apply anymore. Traditional voting habits have been thrown out the window. Polling has proved unreliable. And yet here we are again operating with utter certainty that the GOP primary is already cooked. If there is a surprise on Monday morning, uh, surprise on Tuesday morning as we wake up, uh, what's it going to be? Real quick. I think the surprise would be that Donald Trump wins but only narrowly and that Nikki Haley comes in second. I think those would be two really big surprises. But Donald Trump winning only narrowly. I think would be a heck of a surprise. Now, look, I could predict to you, well, Ron DeSantis winning. That would surprise a lot of people. But we could Wait, go back. Possible to, surprises. But we could go back to the beginning of this race and say we saw how that could have happened. Senator, the surprise will be turnout. You know, 186, 190,000 is the record turnout. We're going to beat that. Uh, really. I believe so. You know, I think there's that, that much enthusiasm. There's enthusiasm, excitement. The campaigns have been working wow. hard. Trump is doing videos on how do you caucus for your first time at every event. Wow. You didn't get the white hat with the gold lettering unless you promise to be a caucus captain. DeSantis has 1,600 precinct captains. Those organizations are going to drive people, and Iowans can handle the cold. Mm -hmm. Caucuses aren't tonight. This snow why, blizzard this, you this drove is why, this is why this is why this is why you come out right. This is why we're here uh, is to get that kind of perspective because you can't get it. Um, from a studio uh, in New York or D.C. talking about this. Gentlemen, it's good to see you. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. Appreciate it. Yep, for Come sure. Back to the state fair. For sure. <laughs> we were there. <laughs> We've talked a lot about how the weather, as you just heard, will play a huge role in these caucuses. Chief Meteorologist Ed Wilson from our affiliate here in Des Moines tells us just how unprecedented, maybe not for February, but for caucus night and for all of us from the East Coast, how unprecedented these conditions really will be. Well, in Des Moines, we are seeing a lot of snow, but it's hard to tell exactly how much fell after the wind has picked up this afternoon and this evening. We have a blizzard warning that lasts until 6 o'clock in the morning. You can see just outside of our studios here at WHO 13, uh, it has been a very long week. In fact, we're looking at record totals possibly for one week of snow ever in the state of Iowa. Over the year, we get about 36 inches. We've already had about 19 here uh, in Des Moines. So tough travel. It is not recommended. Next All right, things are different this year in Iowa. For one, the weather. This may be the coldest caucus in history. And for second, there are no Democrats to be seen. They aren't caucusing on the same night as Republicans like in the past. There are also different rules on how Iowans are going to caucus this year. When doors open at 5 p.m., people will gather in high school gyms, other similar spaces, barns, 
VFW halls, you name it. Speeches begin 7 p.m. and then people write their preferred candidate's name on a piece of paper. After that, the pieces are counted. Jeff Kaufman's here, chairman of the Iowa Republican Party. Good to see you, sir. Thank Good you. For you. Uh, why is it so important for Iowa to do things so differently? Can't we just, you know, have ballots and everybody go in and do it the normal way? Well, if, if you believe in grassroots democracy, caucus is the what you have to do. Uh, the, right now, you go in, and, and we actually uh, develop this caucus ourselves. We get no state dollars to do this. We come in, the candidates have a chance to have a dialogue with their surrogates. And also, we've got a carve-out system. We start with the caucus. We're not supposed to pick the president here in Iowa. We're supposed to actually put together a neutral playing field. Too bad the Democrats screwed things up, or they would be doing it too. But we've held our own. And and we're able to, ultimately, we're going to be able to showcase all of these candidates. And then they can go to New Hampshire, where they just go in and vote, in South Carolina, where they just go in and vote. All right. Give me the most unusual caucus site in all of Iowa. They're not as unique as these because we have to be ADA compliant. In the, in the old days, it was in garages. It was in living rooms. Um, I think we have a wide variety of community centers. We have okay. a bright, but nothing Nothing really unique Nothing like it used to be. Nothing unique anymore. Well, you see some things get ruined, but all right. Uh, <laughs> help us understand. Are we going to have a result on Monday night? The, the results, you'll see them in almost real time as we report them. The votes are counted in the precinct room. The votes are reported in the precinct room, and then you will see those results later. So we're all going to be able to see what those results are. But, yes, we will. I, I said to the gentleman before, you're the party chairman. You may know better than anybody is there something that the polls are not picking up that we need to pay attention to? Well, this is an organizational feat, as every bit as much as a, per, as a personality contest. And so, you know, are there some things that we have missed? Are there some, are there some extra passion among one candidate's uh, supporters that we're not picking up? I don't think we're going to see that until later, but I don't see anything except we've got four candidates right now. They are ready for prime time with their organization. That's why I'm not nearly as concerned about the weather, especially if it's not snowing or ice. Uh, as I have been in the past. It's funny because we're all sitting here from, from out east going, oh, my God, it is so cold it's going to change everything. We talk to, talk to the locals, and they're going, eh, well, it's just, just January. Yep, this is January in Iowa. I mean, we're good. We're looking at the coldest high temps for the Iowa caucuses. Uh, the, the, you have to admit, negative 36, though, is pretty cold. It, it's, a, it's a little chilly, and, but if you, take the right, uh, if you take the right precautions, I think we're going to be fine. Our passion for... Candidates, our passion for grassroots democracy, and our concern for the utter incompetency in the White House right now, okay. they're showing up. Real quick, cold weather, old voters, that has a bigger effect. Right. And old voters typically are breaking for Donald Trump. Is that something to watch? I, you know, I think our, I think our voters that went through the winter of, oh, of 1936, they're all set. Okay. They're going to have people go there. I'm not nearly as concerned. I'm really not. <laughs> I love this. this is great. <laughs> Good to see you, sir. Thank you very Thank you. much. We are live from Iowa again Monday night, starting right here at 7 p.m. I'm going to spend the next couple of days crisscrossing the state as much as the weather allows to get you some interviews with the candidates. 8 p.m., Chris Cuomo, Dan Abrams, Elizabeth Vargas. We all pick up the coverage from here as the results come in. Much more ahead from Iowa. And after doing nothing for months about Iranian-backed militias taking shots at the American Navy, President Biden finally hit back. But this is an election year. It's 2024, and critics on all sides, even from his own party, are now attacking him over the attacks. That, when we come back. Make sure that we respond to who people that continue this outrageous behavior along with our allies. As President Biden earlier talking about the U.S. and U.K. led airstrikes in Yemen tonight, we're learning exactly how those strikes unfolded. The joint strike included more than 100 precision guided missiles from submarines and aircraft, including F.A. 18 Super Hornets. U.S. Central Command released this video of the jets taking off before the strike happened. The National Security Council now says the strikes were successful. They hit 60 targets, 16 different locations run by the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Took out command and control nodes, maybe centers, munition depots, launching systems, and weapons production facilities. Some of the Houthis' most sophisticated weapons obviously come from Iran. The strikes come in response to dozens of attacks on cargo ships and U.S. Navy warships. The Houthis have virtually shut down the Red Sea where 10% of global trade passes through every day. One might think 
That the president finally taking a tougher stand on Iran and Houthi rebels, firing missiles at the U.S. Navy, is something that would sort of universally rally support around the president. But the reality is this president, in January of 2024, and so far nobody's rallied around it. Republicans say it's not enough. Democrats are criticizing him from the left. This strike has opened him up to strong criticism from the left and right. Even some of America's allies overseas, Ro Khanna, progressive from California, the president needs to come before Congress before launching a strike against the Houthis in Yemen and involving U.S. or involving us in another Mideast conflict. That is Article 1 of the Constitution. I will stand up for that regardless of whether a Democrat or Republican is in the White House. With us now, Blake Berman, host of The Hill on News Nation. Hi, Blake. Hey there, Leland. How's it going? Yeah, great. Great here in Iowa. I say it's bitterly cold and frigid and the locals go, yeah, it's a little chilly, maybe put on a sweater. Um, help, help us understand why there is this disconnect from ordinarily a public and party that would rally around a wartime yeah. president that is now not. You have strange bedfellows here, right? You just mentioned uh, Ro Khanna, of course, a, a liberal Democrat who's criticizing President Biden, the leader of his own party, for not notifying Congress. And then you even had Matt Gates who's the, the total opposite of a liberal, liberal Democrat, right, a conservative Republican, who's on the side of Ro Khanna with this, saying, yeah, exactly, you need to go, uh, go through Congress here. Then you had, you know, the House Speaker Mike Johnson and uh, the, the uh, top Republican in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, essentially backing President Biden on uh, authorizing these strikes and going for, uh, forward with them. Of course, some Republicans are saying, look, you know, this goes to show that the Biden administration's posture against Iran has been weak. They need to step it up. They need to take it more seriously. So it, it, it's sort of strange bedfellows here, uh, Leland, yeah. when it comes to, to the response in Washington um, and the decision from the commander in chief. Yeah, you've got the horseshoe of American politics that, that seems to be yeah. kind of coming to be more and more powerful uh, at, the, at the end of the horseshoe. It's almost like a magnet uh, from, yeah. from high school science class. If you think, though, about what you said, the word Iran, interestingly enough, Iran was not mentioned in the president's statement last night. He was asked about a message to Iran, not just to the Houthis, because the, the Houthis just do whatever Iran tells them to. He was asked about that by the press pool following him in Pennsylvania today. If we have that soundbite, we're going to play it. If not, we're just going to ask you about it. We do have it. Here it is. I've already delivered the message to Iran. They know I'm not to do anything. He says they know not to do anything. It, it seems to sort of be that same message of don't uh, without the, the next part of it. Yeah, and it, it's part of the criticisms from the right, right, um, or at least some conservatives here in Washington, that he hasn't been tough enough on Iran. Look at the administration's policies uh, over the years uh, on Iran and that this is sort of a uh, highlights it or, or symptomatic of it. I mean, it was interesting, Leland, today um, uh, the president was asked multiple times about this, um, and, and it was other issues that he talked about, the price of oil, saying, yes, I'm concerned about the price of oil, partly um, you know, why, not necessarily why they did it, but he said it's why we've got to stop the Houthis. Um, he was asked hmm. about, you know, what would you say about members of your own party about the notification process? He said they're wrong. Um, so he, he's been talking about sort of all the other issues here. And in fairness to the president, it's what he was asked about and what he answered. But you're right. Um, you, you know, it, it's it's not as if he's willing to go. And we saw this, of course, um, at the beginning stages of the Israel Hamas war. He's not as willing to go to the next level or to the next step as it relates to Iran, at least. Yeah, in no, there's, no, there's nowhere else. Right, exactly. Yeah, there's nowhere else attached to it. Uh, Blake, th thank you for holding down the fort in D.C. for us. You um, in case anything goes wrong with the signal or any of anything freezes <laughs> out here. And uh, we'll see you soon. Invite you to sign Stay up warm, for bud. War Notes. Gives you a free look at the show. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, 4 p.m. every day. Go to warnotes.com and subscribe. The notes started uh, as an internal email discussion about the most important events of the day. It gives you a look at our thoughts and what we're finding most important about the day and the most important stories. You get to be a part of it. You can respond to the email with your thoughts or join us on social media at Leland Vittard, Instagram or Twitter. It's warnotes.com and subscribe for free. Iowa is perhaps a microcosm for the problems facing Joe Biden that Blake just talked about. This once purple state has turned deep red. It wasn't too long ago that Barack Obama and Joe Biden carried this state. That was 2008. Now, Democrats are hard to find. The only 
Democrat to hold statewide office is State Auditor Rob Sand, which won his last election by less than half a percentage point. He's the author of the book, The Winning Ticket, and is with us now. Good to see you. Thank you very How much. How are you? Thanks Good for having me. I, I said uh, on, on Instagram uh, earlier, I said, you are the most interesting guest of the evening. Uh, and, I, and I mean that. What is it that you are picking up on and has allowed you to be successful in a state that is moving red? Uh, I would, I would uh, although the, a lot of election results have moved to the Republican column, I would put a different picture on it. I come from northeast Iowa. I grew up in a small town of about 7,000 people. Uh, you got to drive an hour to get to a four-lane highway. It's called Decorah. It is in the heart of the biggest Obama-Trump swing county area of the United States, northeast Iowa, southeast Minnesota, southwest Wisconsin. Uh, and, and so I think that I understand those folks because that's where I grew up. That's who I am. And when people ask, you know, how did Iowa change so quickly, I ask a different question. How are Barack Obama and Donald Trump the same? Right? A state doesn't change overnight, but these guys had one common thread between them, and they were people who promised change. They understood that the political status quo, the political establishment, isn't working for a lot of Americans, and they said that they were going to do something about it. And that was something that is, resonates with me. It's part of why I'm in uh, the business that I'm in, and I think voters see that. You heard Blake talk about how the strikes on, a, on the Houthis have made for some unusual bedfellows of the, of the Matt Gateses and the Ro Khanas. And we're seeing that also in uh, various other populist threads. But the area you're talking about, because I've spent time up there and I'm from Missouri, so th there's some similarities there. It, there is a populist thread to those areas, but it's not that Matt Gates Rokana populist. No, it, it's people who want Washington to work. It's people who want Washington to work for Americans, right? It's people who expect that, okay, you've been elected, now go do the job and represent all of us. Right? One of the decisions that I made, well, let me start earlier. When I ran uh, in 2018 and in 2022, one of the things I talked about was that when I was an assistant attorney general, I prosecuted both Democrats and Republicans, right? When I got elected in 2018, uh, two of the people, the two people that I put in the two most senior positions uh, in the auditing staff, our deputies, were an independent and a Republican, despite myself being a Democrat. Hmm. And they were both people who had actually made campaign contributions to my opponent. I want okay. people to work was... together, right? We're supposed to work together. And I think that is what people are looking for in this state. Yeah, well, and in the country, if we want to extrapolate yeah. it out. Uh, yeah. This I thought was interesting, and this goes to what you were talking about. Earlier today, we got a poll from Gallup. Uh, the lowest percentage of Americans ever now identify themselves as members of the Democratic Party. A number of independents have uh. gone up. What do you see? And look, it, it, this is going to be now uh, Americans turning more and more independent. Democrats, the lowest number ever, 27 percent. This election is going to turn on the people that where you come from. What is it that the the status quo and i would put joe biden in that camp sure. what are they, what are they missing about sure. connecting with that group of voters i think to me it's a question of having an oftentimes and i'm not going to this is just in general having a positive vision talking about what your positive vision is working to bring people together right one of the things that i think if if anyone were to ask me uh, you know what what should the president's folks be doing I'd say talk about the bipartisan infrastructure deal, hmm. right? You had Chuck Grassley and, and, and Joe Biden working together, right, with a lot of people in both parties to pass an infrastructure deal when this country hasn't had one for, what, decades prior to that? I mean, it was about time that we got one done, and they did it. They got it. Yeah. They, they worked together. They got it done. That's what I would be talking about. I always think, I always think it's funny when you see Republicans showing up and touting the, the, those, <laughs> the, those infrastructure packages that they brought. That they, they, they voted against. Yeah, they voted yeah. against. Yeah, yeah. It's fun. Hey, it's good to see you. Thank you, you very much. We appreciate the time. You bet. Uh, watch out for this guy. There's, there's something uh, happening that he has uh, caught on to here in Iowa. A live look at Des Moines, Iowa. President Trump lost in Iowa in 2016. He's now up by 30 points. Looks like the storm has perhaps abated a little bit. Maybe people go out in just their sweaters. Party folks here in Iowa, why his campaign, Trump's campaign, is now lowering expectations.
He's got basically a Praetorian guard of, of, of the conservative media, uh, Fox News, um, you know, the, the websites, all the, this stuff. They just don't, they don't hold them accountable because they're worried about losing viewers and they don't want to have the ratings go down. Uh, and and that's, just, that's just the reality. That's just the truth. Ron DeSantis coming out swinging against the media. Normally it's, well, Republicans hitting the media for being too liberal, not too conservative. One of the only candidates braving the snow in Iowa today. Some think he kind of has to. DeSantis has invested heavily in the state. Poor showing here may mean his candidacy, well, could be left in the Iowa snow. With us now, Hal Lambert, DeSantis supporter. Nice to see you. Welcome to Iowa. Thank you. Uh, Is my analysis too harsh? No, I think he does need to do well here. And I think well here is uh, winning, obviously, or, you know, pretty close second. So I think those, those are the two outcomes that we're expecting. So you say either winning or a close second. I'm wondering where, as you guys are watching what has happened, what you feel the polls aren't picking up. May 12th, DeSantis 28 points, Haley 5-5, five, five, Trump 4, 40. Today, DeSantis 13, Haley 20, Trump 54. What is the polls not picking up that makes what you said possible? Well, there's a lot of factors, right? A caucus is very different. And a lot of these polling companies, they don't spend the money. It actually costs quite a bit of money to do a real poll. And so when you go out and you have to, number one, know, you know who are the actual caucus goers, not just a registered voter. Who actually goes out and votes in the caucus? It takes a lot of time, as you've covered. You go to a gymnasium, you're there for an hour. Yeah. This is not a go hit the liver, lever or, or vote by mail. So that's one aspect that I don't think is picked up heavily because we have a great ground game here, and that's, that's going to be the most important thing, and that's, that's historically what's been important in Iowa. One of the reasons we wanted to have you on and are yeah. fascinated by you in particular in this is that you were involved in Ted Cruz's 2016 campaign, yeah. and he won here in Iowa, yeah. uh, although not by the margin you guys wanted. I'm wondering what wisdom you brought to the DeSantis campaign about that. Well, you know, the, the whole team, there's a lot of cruise people on this campaign, actually, and, uh, and they did. They did they, they've been helping heavily in Iowa because they know how to win here. And so that's been, I think, helpful overall for the campaign is not just, you know, people like me, donors like me and investors like me, but also, um, you know, the campaign staff as well. So it's been a, it's been a full effort here in Iowa. And there's, they've been here, by the way, they moved much of the campaign here uh, several months yeah, ago. Look, he's, been in, he's been in 99 counties. Yeah. And Again, I point to the fact that the poll numbers have have gone down, which I, and that's just the facts. I know if they were gone up, you'd be talking to me about them going up. Help me understand the evangelical vote issue here, right? That is Donald Trump, who had real problems with evangelical voters in 2016. That's why he picked Mike Pence as vice president. Has something changed in that? And perhaps you guys haven't been able to capture the evangelical voters you thought? Yeah, I, I don't know that that's the, the actual answer. I mean, there, there's people, people feel comfortable with what they know and what they've seen prior, right? And so he's effectively an incumbent president is what 100%. he is. And so when you have that, that makes it a much more difficult process. You know, people remember the times before COVID, and they have good memories of that, and they want that back. And so in general, that's the view. But I think people, as they start to look at this and they really think ahead, you know, you've, you really, do we want to be in this position in 2028 where you have 15 people on stage competing for the nomination? I mean, if Trump can, Trump can only serve one term. So we're going to be right back to this point where we're going to have all these people trying to get the nomination. I know a bunch of them that want to run in 2028, believe they're me. All calling you they're, to, all, they're, they're all, all ready to run. They're all ready to pull the want, trigger. They all, they all want fundraising. Okay, I'm going to give you the last question. I'm going to give the same one. Uh, in, a, in a friendly sense, there's a chance that we're all wrong, meaning the, the political class, uh, you know, the punditry class and the journalists here and say that we totally screwed this up. And Ron DeSantis either wins or comes in a very strong second. Mm-hmm. What will we have missed that you're seeing? Uh, I think they're going to miss exactly what we talked about, which is what the ground game matters and, and how that works Who's here. Who is it with, though, specifically? Is this ground game with evangelicals? Is it ground game with farmers? Is it ground game? All across the board, because you had a, a lot of money that was able to be spent by the super PAC, and they've been here for a long time, and they've, they've got it built out. They have precinct chairs and all that. They've been, like you said, he went to all the counties, but they have, not only that, they have the precinct people there that are calling. And this weather, it is going to be tricky. I think the numbers are going to be down. I heard an earlier guest say the Republican county person here say that he thinks it'll be high numbers. I don't know. I mean, in 2008, it was 110,000 people voted. It was, a, it was a tough weather period at that time. We could see similar numbers this year, but I think that helps DeSantis 
because I think these other people are going to be a little bit soft. And I don't know if Trump's helped himself because he's talking about being 30 points up. Well, if you're a, a voter here in Iowa, you may not show up because you're 30 points up. All right. Well, <laughs> especially if it's 30 degrees below zero. Hey, good to see you. Thank good you very much. Thank Thanks you for spending much. the time. Live look nearby at Joaquin, Iowa. Next, the results are in. Everyone packs up. All the gear heads to, well, either heads home or heads to New Hampshire. Well, what started in the sweltering heat of the Iowa State Fair could for some end in a frigid night in January. What do the roads out of Iowa, specifically I-80, look like? Yeah. Snow is falling, and even the snow that's not falling, it's still being moved around by the wind. Um, so a lot of that drift is happening. You can even see it as these cars uh, go by on the mm. road. You keep hearing it, right, that the weather for all of us folks from out east is terrible and awful, and Iowans just say it's January. Decision Desk shows Donald Trump with a massive lead, 36 points ahead of the closest rival, Nikki Haley, and the average of our pollings. You're supposed to cover a spread like that, but in the eyes of many, if you don't blow out the competition, you've lost. Weather is a huge factor. Any win over 10 points now, the Trump campaign said it says would be good. Senior advisor for Donald J. Trump for president 2024, Jason Miller is here. Jason, I'm glad to have you because you were here also for 2016. We went through that race as well together. What is different about the Trump ground game and organization in Iowa for 2016 versus 2024? Leland, great question. The folks talk about the experience of the candidate in President Trump having done this before in 16 and 20, now back for his third round with the Iowa caucuses. But also we talk about the experience level of our supporters, of our volunteers. These are folks who may have voted for President Trump in caucuses before, maybe they voted for him in general elections. We also have a mountain of data for people who have joined President Trump at rallies, for example. People who've camped overnight, who've stu uh, stood outside for hours on end to be able to get into events, who are very motivated to vote for President Trump. We saw during the town hall and in other events we've seen uh, folks wearing the white, white hats with the gold lettering saying Trump caucus. Uh, captain and, and have committed there. So you guys got a good list there. I'm wondering about the evangelical vote. So much has been made about the evangelical vote in Iowa. That was a real weakness for President Trump in 2016. It appears as though in 2024 that's turned around. Why is that? And how do you make sure that what appears to be uh, now a strength for President Trump actually remains one and turns out? Yeah, great question. And I would say look at President Trump's record as being the most pro-life president that we've had in our nation's history. With the conservative judicial appointments, the three conservative justices that he appointed to the Supreme Court, President Trump actually has four years in office that he can point to. So there's no guesswork. There's no question about it. And President Trump has really not only proved himself with the evangelical community, but also there are folks in the evangelical community here in Iowa and other places. They're the ones who are encouraging him to run in the first place and will help feel his win on Monday evening. All right. I, I want to get to this, though, because... President Trump, depending on what poll you look at, you look at the averages up somewhere between 30 and 35 points. Um, one of your other advisors, Chris Lakita, a win is a win, but anything over 12 points is a great night. Why lower expectations? Why not, why not think you're going to win by 30 points and put this thing to bed? Leland, why are you trying to raise expectations? Uh, why even say 12 points? Uh, uh, any win <laughs> is a win, and we'll be happy to take it. Now, in the historical context, the largest win ever in a contested um, Iowa caucus is 12 points, actually about 12 and a half points. That was 1988 with Bob Dole. And no candidate has ever actually crossed over that 50 percent mark in a competitive Iowa caucus on the Republican side. So a win is a win. I'll be happy with any margin. There are a couple of historical numbers out there that people have been paying attention to. But you know what? We're going to win here in Iowa. Then we're going to go to New Hampshire, unlike Ron DeSanctimonious, who said today he's going to go on to South Carolina and skip New Hampshire. We're going to win there, go in in South Carolina, and then we're going to go take it to Joe Biden. Uh, for whatever it's worth, I've just gotten in the past uh, 30 seconds or so uh, from the, the team, uh, Trump moving to tele-rallies weekend ahead of Iowa caucus. 
not coming, uh, is at least in terms of what this uh, schedule now says. How is that going to affect things, especially with older voters uh, that, that skew to Donald Trump between him not being here to rally and then the cold on Monday night? Uh, well, I think the folks who passed that along, I realize you're on the area you may have seen this, but got it wrong. President Trump will be coming to Iowa tomorrow on Saturday. Uh, we'll be having tele-rallies. He's actually doing one at this moment, another tele-rally tomorrow on Saturday. The next rally, the next in per first in-person rally will be Sunday, uh, noon central at Indianola uh, here in Iowa. Uh, so he is coming tomorrow. Got it. Uh, President Trump just put out a video to that extent also. And so we look forward to uh, being here soon. He'll, I'm sure he'll be... Uh, uh, enjoying the snow with the rest of us before you know it. Oh, well, there you go. We can all be there together. Enjoy the fire behind you. Good to see you as always. Thank you very much, sir. Live from Iowa again Monday night right here, 7 p.m. Eastern. We're going to hit the road over the next couple of days and go to some of the rallies. Visit President Trump at his rally as well. 8 p.m. Eastern on Monday. Chris Cuomo, Dan Abrams, Elizabeth Vargas join the party for Decision Desk 24. More from a snowy Iowa, but also an incredibly heartwarming piece of good news to share with you when we come back. Well, Eric, it's like somebody has taken the Iowa snow globe and just shaken it all around because the snow is getting blown left, getting blown right, getting blown right in my face. It is just getting nuts out here, honestly. She must not be from Iowa because we've been telling you the weather's pretty bad out here in Iowa. And then all the real local folks say, yeah, just put on a sweater and, and go outside. We're going to be here through Monday night. Tuesday morning, all eyes go to New Hampshire as the Granite State becomes ground zero in the race for 2024. As we've been saying, Nikki Haley could pull off a surprise in Iowa. New Hampshire polling shows she's the strongest challenger to President Trump among her peers there. If she can do well on January 2023, we could be in for a much longer road than anyone would have predicted with us now. Axios congressional reporter Sophia Kai out on the trail in Iowa. She's been become an expert at driving in the snow now. Associate researcher, scholar, lecturer in politics at Princeton University, Lauren Wright. Ladies, nice to have both of you. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, start with you since you're uh, back in, in the studio. Help us understand um, the path, and I know you may say there doesn't want to exist, but the path for Nikki Haley out of New Hampshire that makes this competitive. Unless things turn completely upside down in South Carolina, it's a very tough road for her. And in fact, if we think about years from now, it's even tougher than DeSantis because he'll go back to being governor of Florida. He's in there until January 2027. He can remind everyone that he's really good at this for a few years. For Nikki Haley, if she's not the nominee, she either needs to be in the Trump wing of the party uh, in the administration or do something completely different. And so, uh, yes, uh, both these candidates have a tough road. Sophia, you use the analogy of the snow globe, right? Um, which I think we've all felt like we were in over the past few days. But if you, if, if the race is all of a sudden to get shaken up like a snow globe, mm -hmm. what is gonna have to have happened here on Monday that we're missing? So Nikki Haley, just to do the flip side, of the scenario that Lauren has just put out. Nikki Haley, if she's gonna have to have any shot at all, she's gonna have to come in second or a very, very close third. I mean, that also matters. And then she's gonna have to go to New Hampshire where she's been spending a lot of time. She spent New Year's Eve, New Year's Day there. She's been spending a lot of time in New Hampshire being more strategic in the fewer locations she's been doing in Iowa so that she has the best chance with the more moderate voters in New Hampshire. And then she's gonna take that and kind of run with that, uh, juice that for a couple weeks, if you will, that good showing New Hampshire into South Carolina, which right. is her home state, and that's where she wants to bring it home. Look, the Haley campaign all of a sudden seems to have caught fire at exactly the right moment, yeah. right? DeSantis's moment was when he launched and has then underperformed since then. Haley seems to have timed this perfectly. What are they saying about how they pulled that off? I think, look, they're saying that she's been very consistent with her messaging. She's had a good balance in saying Trump was the right president for the right time, but now we need someone different. Um, you know, she's also saying uh, that she comes prepared. She is uh, has her uh, 
She has, uh, you know, her positions her foreign policy, on foreign policy. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then she's saying, look, we're going to have people in every single precinct where voters are going to show up in Iowa. Lauren, Nikki Haley is perhaps like the central casting candidate for a Republican uh, in terms of a general election candidate. The question is if she can figure out how to pull this off with primary voters, because they're, they're different. Jonathan Martin put, right. pointed out very clearly um, the real divide uh, in the Republican Party right now, and that's all, it was completely apparent in Iowa, is a class divide. The college-educated Republicans and working-class Republicans, they're different people. Uh, what, what is it about Republican primary voters that seem sort of, I don't want to say oblivious, but perhaps not caring about the electability issue? Well, that would mean that voters would have to be completely strategic and they might have to vote against the candidate that they really want. And they really want President Trump. They know President Trump. They like the record. They like the style. And so it's very difficult to get those people to navigate away from a sitting president and vote for someone who is in the administration who's frankly supporting a lot of the same policies. I also think about Nikki Haley. If she does very well in Iowa and especially in New Hampshire, as you're just talking about, Trump will turn up the heat completely on her. And that's very difficult because, you know, she didn't have a very impressive civil war example, not mentioning slavery. And so in these few instances yeah. we've seen, it is possible for her to trip up. And we know Trump will have a laser focus on dismantling her. And I think that could get very ugly. And I don't think we've seen it yet, Leland. Yeah, we haven't seen it yet. Sophia, uh, I, we got 15 seconds, a couple of sentences. Does Trump have a few uh, shotgun shells ready for Nikki Haley? Oh, yeah, absolutely. They're going to hit her on Social Security. They're going to say she's propped up by Democrats. And they're going to say that her, her stances on taxes is problematic and will make life more difficult for voters. All right. We'll see you out there this weekend. Thank you very much, Lauren. Great to have you with us this Friday night as well. Thank you both. We're going to end this Friday with some really wonderful news that we are happy to bring you. Navy Lieutenant Ridge Alconis who's been wrongfully imprisoned in Japan for 500 plus days, brought back to the United States and kept in jail here. He has finally been freed and reunited with his family. These pictures just came to us. Alconis had been jailed in Japan following a car accident and had been recently returned to the United States. We wish him and his family the best. And boy, there is no more devoted wife than Brittany Alconis. We're gonna hit the trail in Iowa. We'll see you back here on Monday night. Here's Chris. Hey everybody, happy Friday. I'm Chris Cuomo. We're live and we got big news. So what do you say? Let's get after it. Finally, finally, it is clear that our government has a lot more to tell about UFOs. Today, the top secret classified UFO briefing took place in Congress and it did move the needle. How do we know? We got somebody who was behind those closed doors in Congressman Tim Burchett, a.k.a. Captain Carhartt, and one of the men who got this whole ball rolling, a Navy whistleblower who claims to have seen UFOs with his own eyes. They're both here for...